Ah, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you've had a long day, and um, it's, uh, it's kind of a bit disconcerting being given the topic of uh, security and privacy at the end of a long day. And it's especially challenging after hearing it mentioned so many times during this conference that I'm a bit worried about sort of feeling as though I've been given the, the job of trying to solve world hunger um, in this sort of last presentation by covering this big topic. Um, so I think you'll excuse me if I don't uh, try to cover all of the elements uh, in, in sort of uh, tackling this, um, but actually bring to you some of the experiences that we've had um, in our business, which is to do with joining stuff up, that connectivity bit that links all of those brilliant things that so many people have been doing in embedding ideas, capability, and intelligence in remote things, and then joining that up in some kind of way. And, um, and of course, I'm sure all of you will have noticed that this has gained some, in, uh, uh, some real publicity recently, as, uh, as we've had um, uh, David Cameron meeting Angela Merkel talking about the Internet of Things. And uh, they've been coming out with great phrases uh, like, this technology is going to be bigger than the Industrial Revolution, bigger than humanity, and the UK and Germany are going to lead this which is always encouraging, I think. And uh, some wag came up with the idea that this was all going to be put into place because Germany was going to do that amazing stuff. And I think uh, Mr. Cameron said, uh, you're going to build, we're going to bring the German industrial manufacturing capability, joining it with the UK's intelligence and creativity to create the Internet of Things. And somebody said, OK, so the Germans will build the machines and we'll do the website. Now, that was quite an interesting way to approach it. But, of course, there are some elements of this where it does look like the Industrial Revolution. We've got things that are coming together that were previously unrelated. And uh, it, it won't have escaped your attention to know that during that Industrial Revolution time, um, lots of people were doing things that were all contributing to this big picture, but they were relatively unjoined up. So it was quite possible to start making um, the, the sort of the first uh, iron and cast iron pots and bridge elements and construction devices and so on. And they did that in places like Telford, which was great. And Wedgwood produced crockery for the first time that was at a price that people could afford. S suddenly, you could get a pot to make your stew in and you could buy something to serve it in and you could do it. And most people could do this at a price that they could suddenly afford. Almost every person in the country could now do this. The problem was that people like Wedgwood couldn't actually get this stuff to the market because when they stuck it on a horse and cart to deliver it to Birmingham or wherever it was going to go, by the time it had got there over the rutted rows, all of the crockery was broken. So fortunately, at the same time, we had the coming together of the canals that enabled things to be carried and transported in a way that didn't destroy it on the way to get it there. And they delivered it in a way that people could use. And what was happening was that there was a coming together of apparently totally unrelated elements to create an ecosystem of things that then took off. And it seems to me that actually we're at that kind of same stage when we're talking about the Internet of Things. Lots of people in this room are contributing to certain elements of it. But actually, we really haven't grasped what this is going to do yet. And in the process of putting this together, we're in danger of repeating some of the mistakes that happened during that time. Because inevitably, you get outcomes that you don't expect from these new things coming together. One of the outcomes was, of course, is that some people's standards of living suddenly grew like mad, and other people's deteriorated abysmally. And what we want to do is we want to start seeing these things come together in a way that works. And what we don't want are the side effects that are not very comfortable for us. Now, We've had some experiences of doing some bits around the edges of this um, because we've found a way of joining up stuff to some kind of back office system, and you kind of know all that already. It's kind of boring when you join a GSM network to some kind of device out there and you get some kind of output coming in and then you shove the information in this blimmer great database and you churn it around and you say, ha ha, we've done something that nobody's done before. Um, well, we've been doing that, and we've got some experiences of people challenging that and trying to make it go further. And we work in a whole load of different sectors. And 
It's because of that that we've seen this, this sort of split between sort of local and international, this kind of consumer and corporate, these different areas of people coming together, that we've started to spot some real issues that arise. And some of those issues are to do with, we've got these things in place, but now we've got some data, now we've got access to it, we've realized that there's some problems. Because inevitably, when you start monitoring and controlling and managing things, one person's security becomes another person's unnecessary re restrictions. Some safety constraints actually become somebody else's problem. Um, the energy information you've got from one person actually becomes something that means something totally different to somebody else. And actually, you're never quite sure who's going to use this data and for what. And one of the challenges I often put out at conferences like this is to say, why do you think somebody's actually bought this service? And um, I, might, I might ask you a question now, just because it's a boring part of the afternoon and you're going to be sleepy. Um, we, we've, um, we've had to put some monitor um, CCTV cameras at level crossings. Anybody get any idea why you might do that? Somebody must have an idea. Go on. Check. Spot on. Check there's nobody on the level crossing where the train's coming along. Great idea, wrong answer. Anybody else got an idea? Sorry? Prosecuting somebody that's on the railway line. That's a good idea. No, that's wrong, but, but actually closer to the right answer. Go on. Well, very good. How that, that man needs a round of applause there because actually, well done, there's a round of applause, perfect. Um, actually, the whole idea was if somebody drives through the barrier and the barrier's coming down and they damage the barrier, you want to be able to take a picture of their number plate so you can bill them, which is kind of the thing that you wouldn't initially expect. And we've got a whole load of applications like that. Um, and uh, the great one is actually seeing people putting communications into vending machines. I'm sure you've all seen that. That's what everybody says is a great use case. Anybody got any great ideas why you might do that? Why would you want to know how many products are being sold in a vending machine at the time of the day and how much they were buying them for? So you could change the pricing. That's a really cool idea. Coca-Cola got into terrible trouble about that. Anybody else? So you can restock it, yeah, and you can look after it goes wrong. Actually, it's nothing to do with that. They just wanted to know which products were being bought at what time of the day so that the advertising campaign could be more effectively focused. Because if you knew that it was being sold at this height in a vending machine by the swimming pool at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you get a pretty good idea of who was buying it. Gives you an idea well, it's 7 o'clock in the morning at a railway station. It's obvious. The tricky bit about it was is that, as we've all known, those little tiny bits of information get used for purposes that we don't necessarily expect, and the motivations and drivers are not always obvious. And so the idea of privacy and IoT is often described as an oxymoron, because actually we don't really know what we mean by that privacy and security. We don't have any real confidence in a lot of these things, because how do we know what is going on, why it's being used, who controls who knows what's going on? And how do you know that the stuff is actually real? One of the problems that we had in providing remote communication systems to thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of machines, was that you could pick up information from them, you could churn it around, you could work on how to control something else, and we had a blooming great system doing all of that. And we were quite good at it, and we wanted to do, make it even better, so we we built some new software and we thought we'd test it by throwing tons and tons of pretend machines at it. What we discovered is we couldn't tell the difference between the pretend ones and the real ones. That leads you to an interesting challenge, is how do you know that the things you think you're controlling are actually real machines? And when they report information to you telling you that the pipeline has been redirected or that the pumps have been turned on or that the light switches are working, that it is actually a real thing that's doing it. That's kind of a really basic question. Because actually, as that, as that famous cartoon says, on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. Because you can pretend you're something else. And actually, it's a very, very difficult to know whether the real thing is a real thing. 
is also quite a challenging thing to know what you're really going to care about. Because we know sometimes that it's very useful to pick up information from something, but actually, do we care about the information as a source or what we're going to do with it? So we have a challenge. And um, interestingly enough, the European Union, in its wonderful wisdom, has decided to have a look at this. And it's identified a number of characteristics that we should care about, or it thinks we should care about anyway. And the first three are interesting because they come up with ideas that actually go way beyond all of those things that we normally think of as kind of information security, all of those security protocols, all of those lock-ins and keys, all of those kind of things that actually pretty well have been solved. They say things like continuity of service. That's an interesting question. Um, they say user lock-in is a big issue, and designed insecurity is key. Now, design insecurity has pretty well been taken care of by most of the things that all of you guys understand. No point in me talking about that, because you know it loads better than me. What they did talk about was the issues of continuity of service and user lock-in. Now, strangely enough, one of the big challenges that we found some of the, uh, the clients that we're talking about are finding is that they've got hundreds of thousands of devices connected, but they have to use different commercial companies to make those connections work. And none of them wants to be locked into a contract or into a supplier that is going to have to be there for the next 25 or 30 years. <coughs> And for some of the remote pieces of equipment that we see out there that we're actually having to support as legacy systems now, they've been out there for 50 years. Can you imagine a 50-year contract with Vodafone or Telefonica or any one of the companies that might be providing those remote connections to you? Probably not. Now, those things, these things, these first three things are pretty straightforward and they're covered by most end-to-end M2M systems, which are really associated with sort of enterprise systems and, and kind of structured silos. But there's a bunch of others that they've got on their list, which is another six. There are actually a few more, but the documents are pretty big and heavy and boring. So I thought I'd just give you the highlights. And these other ones are to do with contextual risks, which we've sort of kind of alluded to today. Like if you've got a sensor that's actually monitoring something in your home, um, how do you know whether that is significant or not at that moment? So, um, a, a prime example of that is, is a kind of trivial one, or what might be trivial, which is about somebody going out of hospital, they go home, you put all kinds of monitoring equipment on them and all that kind of stuff. Now, we've been involved in some of those things. Very sophisticated, very clever systems. And the idea is, is that the local doctor can work out who to go and visit. Sounds like a great plan. What they discovered, what they discovered soon after putting these things into place, was that it was rather than using all this sophisticated equipment that was quite difficult to set up, it was much easier to simply monitor their kettle. So that if Granny had got up this morning and made a cup of tea, the chances are she was probably okay. If she hadn't got up that morning and, and hadn't turned the kettle on, maybe not. That was really made it much simpler to do. But then as soon as you start putting simple devices like that into the home, then you start realizing that the contextual information about when they're boiling the kettle tells you something about their lifestyle. Tells you when they're there and when they're available. So that's always a challenge. There's the issue of traceability. We'll come back to that one in a minute, and unlawful processing. So who's got the information and what have you done with it on the way before you bring it somewhere else? Whether you can change the purpose for the data, well, we've already spoken about that in two or three different ways. How do you make it so that people can get their rights to the information they might have by any device you put in their home? Whether there's going to be some kind of loss of control of that. So, for example, as soon as you start associating your washing machine with the nature of your jumper that you've just bought, that then you put on the wrong program on your washing machine and now it's shrunk and you take it back to the shop, and say, my jumper's shrunk, they'll then say, oh, well, you've watched it on the wrong program, sir. We've been able to look that up. Isn't that an interesting way of starting to think about how your rights might be affected by the way in which you might start joining up basic bits of information? And then noticing whether there's any, any kind of attack on the equipment itself. 
This is the time when we start joining up information in lots of different ways. We start actually creating a diversity of environments. So we go from the first three of those things, which is this monoculture, where we've got something that's rather like a kind of, um, sort of like, like a vineyard here, where we've got a sterile environment, we know what's being grown, we know what's being fed to the, those crops, and we know when we're going to pick those crops, and we know what we're expecting as a result. To the true Internet of Things environment, which is in the wild. Here you just throw the stuff out there. And lo and behold, you'll join the things up, and some new information will come out of it. That's much more like the internet, much less like what we're seeing in most of the systems we've been talking about today. This is an environment where you can't tell what's going to happen. This is the environment where, by putting a bunch of machines together, you might create something totally new that none of us have ever imagined that could grow up and flourish in certain ecosystems and not in others. This is where it becomes really difficult to predict what the results are going to be. So the only way we can handle that is by trying to actually break it down and create kind of walled gardens around these things. Walled garden isn't a really very good term for this, but it was the only one I could think of. And I'm sure some of you have got some better ideas of describing it, where we can capture some of this and we can allow things to grow and develop and mature in lots of different ways by giving them an environment that actually isn't too big for them to grow in. And one of the ways in which we've been trying to do that is we've been taking, trying to do some of this in some ways or another, and this is, this is part of our experience, which is to take what we've called our kind of M2M engine, which is the thing that we've been used for joining stuff up, and actually shrinking that down so you can actually put that in your own enterprise. So you can create something of your own internet of your own stuff. Now that's... That's the kind of start thing that, um, you know, we, very fortunately, our, our friends at Oracle were talking about earlier on today, about how to make some of that connectivity work in an environment that is actually truly meaningful to your organization, but actually enable that diversity to develop. Now, we've been, we've been experimenting with this, and it certainly seems to be something that can create elements of space where stuff can grow, and you can have confidence in it. And the reason that's happened is because people have come to us and said, we've got a problem because we've got lots and lots of machines out there and we're really worried about that information, about those identities of those devices being known even to the service provider that provides the connectivity to those things. Purely because seeing the patterns of behavior can tell them where the points of attack might be. So therefore, people would have said, okay, let's see if we can extend our corporate intranet to a kind of extra net of things, and then we'll sort of kind of solve all of those horrible interrelationship problems with all of those different protocols with some kind of enterprise service bus. Now, some of that's working. Some of that's looking good. But it still has a lot of challenges attached to it. But by putting those things in that walled garden, at least we've created a place for that kind of sort of harmonious, if you like, diversity of things. But then we come to that question of veracity and trust. And I'm sure you've all come across the challenges that occurred last year when we know everything about the supply chain. And we know how to turn a cow into a lasagna. We know every element of that process and every single processing stage for that, that meat is understood. And of course that works brilliantly if you know what the thing is when you start. But if you substitute something for it at the beginning, every element of the process can work and be fully verified. And it's hardly surprising that the supermarkets had no clue what the thing was at the beginning. Because when you substitute a cow for a donkey or something like that, after that point, the system just runs. So one of the things that um, we've been exploring, and I think we're beginning to get right is the idea of trying to not only work out how to make these different elements work with an understanding of those sort of some of these areas of that social security, understanding what's important to watch out for, but also trying to work out how we can source the thing and know that it's real. 
And to do that, um, we, we've been involved in trying to construct some kind of Internet of Things engine so that we can create that it's bi-directional, secure, private system that is actually open enough for people to use. And the only way we've been able to do that is by working with some of the global internet companies to actually bring that into place. So some of those partnerships are beginning to come to fruition right now. And join that up with other people who can actually provide not only a reliable core infrastructure, but actually bring the veracity and trust to it that's needed. Now, this means to say that the ecosystem is absolutely vital because within it, we need to be able to address everything from the hobbyists, the people who are just playing and experimenting at the edges of this, right the way through to those industrial concerns where they actually have to rely upon these things. Otherwise, the water or electricity or other supplies just don't get delivered. And that's why I think that organized conferences like this are really good, because actually bringing together the diversity of this community, just like you had to have the steel makers, the canal builders, and the china manufacturers into one kind of ecosystem to make it so that this revolution can occur is pretty vital. And so what I really wanted to do was to say, this is the place where we should, those exchanges should start happening, and it needs to happen on a much broader basis. And we need to collaborate to make this work. And some of the things that we've been seeing happening today when people have been talking about the openness of relationship is as important as the openness of systems, is as important as the openness of conversation that we need to have that takes us from the can this be reliably, securely transmitted with some internet key between things, but can we think about the way in which we understand and view security and privacy for our society so that we can avoid some of those problems that occur when you get any revolution occurring. Because we mentioned today already Nike in his running shoes. And we know that they've actually had this problem of saying, actually, are we a shoe manufacturer or are we really the supplier of data? Because this actually highlights one of the issues. And I'm sure you've come across this. If you haven't, the idea with the running shoes is that they'll tell you how brilliant you are at running. They tell you how marvelously fit you become and how you're going to have the best body in the world as a result of using these shoes and how your life is going to be made more wonderful. And of course, if you connect that up to a true Internet of Things system, when you're running in the dark, you might turn the street lights on. Wouldn't that be nice? Would that be a nice thing to happen as you be running down the street at night and lights come on, as they do in Germany, that's a great idea, isn't it? But then the question is, who decides whether that happens? Can I decide whether I want to publish that data or not? <coughs> Would I really want someone to spot me running down the road where I have forgotten to turn off my shoes and suddenly all the street lights come on? And it might seem like a good idea to me, giving me safety, security. It might sell more shoes. It might be great if you're a light salesman. But then it might be a bad idea for the local, uh, the local taxpayer who says, hey, it's expensive. They're using my money to put the lights on for this one guy running down the street. It's, in, it's made our carbon footprint deteriorate. We've got light pollution. It's uncontrollable. And it's a jolly bad use of taxes. So the question is, is where do we go from here? How do we create those conversations? And let's start talking now. Thank you.